<clears throat> okay, here we are again for this other episode, a new episode with Andrea Paoli today on how to apply for a PhD position and what uh, makes a successful uh, PhD experience. Welcome, Andrea. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so shall we start with a short self-introduction? Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So my name is Andy, as Giorgio already introduced me. So I'm a group leader at the moment at the IMP in Vienna. So, uh, so I've been here now for five years, roughly, um, leading a group of developmental biologists, but also biochemists. So we do many different things. So we work overall, everyone in my lab works on superfish. So this is the common common theme. So we have multiple different projects, but I think we are centering in on the, I think, very fascinating and important question, how an, how an egg transitions into an embryo and how an embryo then afterwards forms. So this is a very, very universal question and that we study in the superfish because there we have access to these embryos and it's a vertebrate organism. So therefore, I think this is a great model to study this very uh, fundamental question, how life starts. And oh. that is, I think, yeah. <laughs> That's a great pitch. <laughs> you get it done. <laughs> Okay, Andy. So let's uh, let's start with this. You are in a kind of a, a unusual position because you are actually now a PI, a group leader, in the same place where you did your PhD. Is that correct? It's true. <laughs> Although it's not in the same place, actually. We moved not, building. Not the, not the same physical place, <laughs> but the same institute. So tell us a little bit how, how it is to go from uh, one side uh, of the barricade to the other. What is your experience? In well, this? that's an interesting question that you ask because, in fact, I, when I said now that we are not in exactly the same place, this is true now because the IMP got a new building, I think three years ago, where we literally moved into a new building. But before, when I came back for starting my lab five years ago, um, I literally got the same lab where I did my PhD. So that was the one lab that was empty. So I did my PhD in gymnasium's lab at the IMP and that lab happened to be empty. So I was basically assigned into this lab and I took the bench that I had as a PhD student when I started my own lab as a group leader. So for me, it was very exciting to come back. I have to say, so I would have never ever imagined to go back to the same place for the main reason that I totally switched topic and field. So during my PhD, I worked on a, on a topic of chromosome segregation and sister chromatid cohesion. And the IMP was not known to be particularly strong or very interested in developmental biology. But for my postdoc, I had joined a lab on superfish embryogenesis and got very interested in superfish. And for me, it was clear that I would never be able to go back to the IMP where superfish, there was no superfish facility, this didn't exist. So when I heard about the job opening, I was also invited here for a talk before, and I got a feeling that maybe there is interest in actually getting someone that does developmental biology, maybe even with superfish, I was super excited. So it was really cool to come back. I think it had two sides. One side was it almost felt a bit like coming home because the IMP, it was a very special place that it was a community, so where there is very flat hierarchy. So it's not really that we have their strong structure. So, but students talk to faculty, fac students talk amongst each other a lot. And this was a place that I haven't really never forgotten. And I always thought this would be amazing to go back. So now being on the other side, I think initially was interesting at beer hours, for example, where I still didn't feel like a group leader. I felt very much like being a student or a postdoc. Um, and but I think it is the, the atmosphere has remained as it was, I think, as a student. It's very, everyone is very excited, driven. Uh, it's an international environment, which I very much liked. Um, now seeing it from the other side, I think I see even more how the benefits that the IMP already had as a student, because I have seen other places in between, um, which are very good places. But I think in terms of the uh, community, effect that we have here. I think it was very hard to get to this level, in particular, like the crosstalk between different labs. So we work on many different things, but every lab pretty much knows of each other what we are doing, because we have once a weekly seminars where students and postdocs present. 
And that makes it very open that even students, postdocs can approach another lab. They know what's going on in another lab, in, in another lab and we can collaborate directly with people from totally different fields. And this, in the other places where I have been, this has not been like this. So there you worked in your lab, you were very focused on your science, you knew a lot about this, but you didn't really know that much about, for me, for example, neurobiology or organoids or stem cells or biochemistry, cryo -EM. So I think here we are exposed pretty much on a daily basis to all these different topics. And this is something that I very much enjoy. And this is, has stayed the same. And this is why I think it's really a fantastic environment to start your lab. Right. And to be <laughs> totally, in the field. totally agree. So one, one place that one, one thing that is uh, special about this place is that, as you say, that there is a lot of interdisciplinarity and interaction and students are exposed to a number of um, research and papers and, and so on. Um, how does it translate in real life? Do you think the students do really uh, interact with their peers? Do, do they really, uh, um, collaborate? Because this is something that, you know, we often say it's nice, there is a chance, but does it really happen in a place like that? I think it happens, um, but it, it can be somewhat um, encouraged by us group leaders or by the environment, but in, in the end, it has to happen bottom up. So it has to be really the students and postdocs that would want it. Because if I, as a group leader, I would say, you should now talk to the other person because they do this. I can say this, but, and I can initiate it. And I think it is very much we as group leaders, I think, initiate sometimes these conversations. But then it's really up to the students to continue or the postdocs to continue these uh, and follow up uh, with their own ideas. And I can only say from my own experience, we have, in some cases, it works extremely well so that students want to continue and they help each other across labs. There doesn't matter whether you come from a different institute even here, but it's on our campus and they are very active there. And then we are very much hands off their SPIs. In other cases, you tried something and then it didn't work out. So I think I wouldn't say that it always works out this uh, communi communi communication in terms of uh, or also collaboration as effort. But we have many projects now, not only me in my lab, but also other labs where I see that they, where they are sometimes are even joint students or joint uh, postdocs that are literally supervised and that have a project that requires the expertise from two labs and then you're really having two supervisors and that I think on a place like this where we have core funding so meaning everything is in principle shared so it's not that something belongs to one lab and then it's yours and the other thing is the other's lab so here I think it's much easier for us to, to really lift this collaborative effort than in many other places so it's maybe a bit an unfair comparison because for us with the core funding this makes it very easy because we have shared microscopy our fish facility is open in principle to everyone so it's not that much about who the resources ha has and then it's really very easy there to, to share knowledge to share ideas and to, to help out each other right. that's a good point it's not just about putting people next to each other it's also about giving them the resources to do things mm -hmm. okay since we've been talking about the place uh, why don't you tell us already um how does um the uh, phd program work and the bbc uh, so it's a, it's a many institutes, it's what, six, five institutes together, something like that. So I think we, so we have now a new version of this, it's a joint PhD program that actually has uh, three research institutes. Uh, so this is the IMP, the IMBA, which is the neighboring institute, and also the GMI, which is the Plant Institute, the Gregor Mendel Institute. And in addition, the Max Perutz University also joined this. So meaning it has a university and it has three research institutes that jointly have this international PhD program. So this is a very old, well, very old, it's uh, I think 25 years roughly, um, is the program already old and it's international. So meaning we recruit from all over the world, which is great because we get really very, very good students and the requirement is normally that you have a master thesis already before or a master but in some cases in exceptions we also um, accept if someone applies with a bachelor it depends a bit on your country where you come from and then it's an application that is an online application and then every every application will be seen by four group leaders and and scored and then based on that we make a short list of people that we invite for for interviews and then for interviews if it's non-covid time then we invite people on site so they are invited here for four days i think come to vienna 
and see the place and where you have then the chance to to interact with group leaders but also first you would have a um where you present a paper and also where you present your former research that you have done like as a master thesis research and then if you pass this then you basically interact with with groups and and pis and there you try to find a match so this is always rather stressful for for both sides one has to say not only for the students so it's it's fun but it's also stressful because it's it's really like speed dating we often say because you have two days roughly to find a match which sounds insane but the crazy thing is that it really in most cases works so during these two days you basically try to figure out which lab you would want to join and then when you come here you immediately are fully embedded in this lab and you would immediately work in this lab so we don't have a rotation system which is different to many other places All right so speed dating is a good is a good metaphor so what do, what do you look for in a student in these uh, two days what is it that uh, can what can they do to impress you <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's always a very good question. And I think it's very personal, of course. Some people would look for skills that the student would already have if someone has worked in the same topic. I personally don't look for the skills. I wouldn't say not at all, but I have not recruited a single student that had been working on Superfish before. So this for me, for example, is no requirement whatsoever because I myself have switched topics and switched fields uh, many times and for me it was always kind of enriching and i always think that the learning a model organism is really fast and easy because people in the lab will teach you but it's really the interest that counts so if you're interested and excited about that topic and willing to learn that for me is the main thing so for me i don't i don't look for a specific background so for me it's someone that is motivated that is interested in what we do and ideally also um, uh, is highly motivated. So because that is something that I think is very hard to learn. So versus a technique or a model system, you can absolutely learn having this intrinsic drive, the motivation, the curiosity that I think is very hard to learn. So that I'm looking for people that have this already. And also what is very important for me, I think, is that I get the feeling or the sense that you are a team player, because for me, a science is really not at all about one person doing an experiment or one person figuring something out. But I think it is a lot about being able to communicate with each other and fitting in my team. So I could have an excellent candidate, but if my lab would say this person doesn't fit into our team, um, I would not take the student, even though it would be hard, but I wouldn't, because I think it's super, super important to have there someone that fits in. So it's, and it might change over time that the lab changes as well and the, the atmosphere changes, but I think it is very important that someone fits in with the expertise, with the skills, with the interest, but I'm not looking for any specific set of skills. Right, so I'm glad you this came up because I, I think every single chat or interviews, we want to call them, that I had so far, more or less, uh, at the end we arrived to this point where skills are probably overestimated on the student side, right? So often the students say, oh, I will not apply this here to for PhD because I, I need to gain some lab skills. That's not necessarily what, <laughs> what the PIs are looking for, not quite lab skill. I completely agree. Okay, and um, another 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 doubt that often applicants have, uh, and is particularly relevant in a place like uh, like yours, that is uh, very international, is uh, also the mastering of the English language. So, how can we encourage students who feel maybe you know not hundred percent on their English that it's okay to apply even in those cases? Yeah, I think it's it's a really important point because. Most people, I think, that apply here um, are non-native speakers. So we all, I am not a native speaker, as will be obvious when I speak. And I think, every, I think one needs to be somewhat able to communicate enough that you can make the other person understand what you say. So I think you need to have a certain basic level of English knowledge. Otherwise, I think you will not be able to, to be here as a student because the working language in our place, even though Austria is a German speaking country, we don't speak German here. So in my lab, we speak entirely English and everything here in the Institute is English speaking. All talks are English. So if you can understand and communicate in English, you will be absolutely fine. You don't need to be a perfect 
English speaker, so this is absolutely not necessary. And I can say from my own experience, when I started applying to my PhD, I had done like some kind of international master program before where I was exposed a bit to English already. But at the beginning of this master program, I was horrified about even giving a, sing a simple presentation in English. So I had never done this. And the first time I had to think of every single sentence and I wrote it out because I was like, I'm not going to be able or I don't know how to say this. And now I have the opposite. So now sometimes I'm asked to give a German a talk in German, for example, here, science by the pint in a pub or something. And then they require you specifically to give a talk in German. And I find it absolutely horrifying now <laughs> because I it's much more I'm much more used if I talk about science to talk in English than in German. And that is, I think, what it also shows. So you don't need to be perfect when you start. You need to be able to be at the some level that you can communicate but i think it gets so easy over time because everyone here will speak in english and you will just pick it up so you will be exposed to it all the time and you don't need to be perfect when you start and we get many applications where the english is not perfect and that doesn't matter so as long as you can show that you are will become that you have the skills and the or not necessary skills i would say but the attitude and the motivation uh, the willingness to learn and to become there embedded in, in a group and work really on a scientific project, then I think this is all that is required. Good. <clears throat> Final question, maybe. So um, one aspect about the PhD programs um, is that they might seem a little bit more formal than just the regular PhD application, because the regular PhD application, you get in touch with the with PI, you maybe start exchanging emails, you might have a call like this one via Skype. So you, you start creating, building up a relationship with them, which might be a bit less formal. Why PhD program, it's all at once, and it seems like there is a lot of competition uh, that you experience on your own skin with other students and everything. So how do you, how do you um, think one could actually make this process a bit less formal? Um, thinking now from the student's point of view, for instance, what do you think about um, making early contacts with the with the PIs you're interested in? Hmm. So I think from our side, we have this very standardized application as Giorgio mentioned. So this is like a questionnaire or you have to enter there certain, uh, certain things. It's not very much actually what we require you to uh, enter. But we do, it's, there's absolutely nothing wrong about contacting a lab <laughs> beforehand. Write, it, write the PI an email and say, oh, I'm really interested in your lab. I want to apply to, to the PhD program. And, or I have already applied, I've sent my application. And I would be, if I basically I'm invited, I would be really excited to talk to you or I already have an idea what I might want to do. And some PIs, I think, I think everyone would write back, but but some PIs might even want to schedule already a Zoom call beforehand just to talk to you, to, to find out what is your interest, could this be a good fit? Because for us PIs, there is nothing better than already knowing that there is someone that would be an excellent fit where you are like, oh, this is perfect. This student is great for my lab. And then there is, uh, this was the best situation because then you basically avoid the stressful situation uh, in the speed dating and everything that you would not know. Or you haven't yet talked to anyone versus otherwise you could have already in a very relaxed environment kind of maybe chatted with the PI or at least told them that you would be interested. Of course, there's no guarantee, there's no promise because we can't promise also from a PI side. So we are not allowed, we can't hire outside of the PhD program. So meaning you have to still go through the selection. So you would have to do the whole process. But if you have already with someone a very good relationship and you would know that this might be a very good match, then I think it's it makes it easier for you as well to go through the application. So I think there's nothing wrong about it in applying, in, in telling, emailing a PI that you would be interested. Okay, so <clears throat> are you recruiting uh, PhD students for the next round? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I haven't actually thought about it. So we just had a selection in December, but I didn't recruit there. So I might very well participate again in summer. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> I think you should be ready to receiving a quite a, a larger number of EU application probably because the, well, I hope the, so. the UK has been, <laughs> it's been deviated <laughs> by. <laughs> okay, and so thanks a lot. That was really fun. And uh, thank you a lot for your insights. And yeah, I hopefully cool. it's going to be useful for people who want to apply your way towards Vienna. Hmm? I hope so, or to any anywhere else. I think and this I is some general. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks a lot and okay. bye. Okay. Cool. Okay. Bye bye.